by way of announcement on June 29th and June 30th in Vienna, Virginia, Bishop Williamson will be there for the Pontifical Mass. This is the 25th anniversary of uh, the consecration of the bishops in 1988. So it's a very uh, happy occasion, of course, a great event. And uh, it would be great if all the bishops were together. Archbishop Lefebvre told the four bishops, stay united in the faith. Stay united in the faith. But sadly we have seen now this, these steps towards making a reconciliation with modernist Rome and without Rome's conversion. And this is a deadly, deadly direction that has been taken. And the fruits of it are disastrous. Confusion, division, uh, distrust of authority, ambiguity, contradictory phrases, liberalism, and modernism. And uh, the... the the Archbishop Lefebvre wanted the four bishops to stay united in the faith. But once you start slipping from the faith, you get in trouble. So anyway, this celebration nevertheless will take place. And it will be in Virginia near Father Ringrose's parish. Father Ringrose is, a, is an all-time warrior, independent priest, a friend of the Society of St. Pius X for many, many years. And because he resists this direction towards liberalism and modernism, he has been basically cut off. And now he, he's, he's been basically uh, axed from the friendship of the society. He's a very good priest. And um, also Father Ortiz is there with him. Father Ortiz is a society priest of the resistance. And he's there helping Father so this event will be June 29th, June 30th. Father Pfeiffer wants a thousand people and more there. So if you uh, care to fly over there for it, you're most welcome to come. And there'll be many priests um, from all over the world, including the monks from Brazil. And um, we'll see if any of the, the nuns from Europe come. As you know, there's uh, the Carmelite nuns in Germany who also see the liberalism happening and uh, these sweet, pious and sacrificing, smiling nuns, Carmelite nuns who are always cloistered and live begging, these girls have more backbone than most of the clergy right now. And they told, with all respect of course, uh, they told Bishop Fillet and Bishop the Galeretta, do not come here anymore. You are no longer friends of Catholic tradition because you are watering down the true Catholic faith. You are accepting Vatican II in the so-called light of tradition. You are accepting the new mass as legitimate, which Archbishop Lefebvre said could not ever happen. And you're accepting completely, totally the new code of canon law. And all the liberal, all the liberal and modernist doublespeak, the punishment and unjust treatment of the, the true sons of Archbishop Lefebvre who are saying, Your Excellency Bishop Fillet, this is wrong. You cannot be going this direction. Bishop, Archbishop Lefebvre said, Do not go this direction. And those good priests throughout the world have been smashed, silenced, transferred, have been crushed. And one of them in France has been going through trials in Menzingen, and uh, he's probably going to have a ner nervous breakdown. Father Matthew Selenev, pray for him. And uh, uh, it's very, very sad. It's very, very sad. But you cannot live in the clouds. You cannot live pretending it's not happening. We live in a warfare. We are in a spiritual battle to the day we die. And these days we knew the Virgin Mary told us they're going to come when the darkness would spread over the whole church. The faith will be lost. Rome will lose the faith and become the seat of the Antichrist. That's not fiction. It's not fairy tale. It's not doom and gloom. 
It's reality. And so if God put us at this time, and especially you children who are going to receive your God for the first time today, God will give you special strength, special grace to become saints in these days. So these are days to rise up to the occasion to be saints and to uh, trample over the world, trample over the deceits of the devil, and by the grace of God, aim for heaven and fight for heaven and keep the faith. Today, on the first Pentecost, the Virgin Mary was with the Apostles, and they were in the Cenacle where our Lord had the first Mass, the Last Supper. And they were there praying, and they were preparing, because our Lord told them He would send the Holy Ghost. And on this day, the first Pentecost, there was heard throughout the city a huge rumble of wind. And down over the heads of the apostles came flames of fire that descended on the Virgin Mary and from her over all the first pope and the first bishops of the Holy Roman Catholic Church, the apostles. And they were filled with fire. And the apostles who were like mice, afraid, because they were hunted down by the Jews. The name of Jesus was forbidden to be spoken all throughout Jerusalem, especially in the temple. Any followers of our Lord Jesus Christ had a death threat. And hence the first wave of persecution on the apostles. And they were scared. They were like little mice. Little mice. And the Virgin Mary, she's the mother of the first pope and the apostles, and she, she was a mother to them all. And she strengthened them, and through her they visibly saw, through Mary, the graces come. Through her, the Holy Ghost descended and descended on the other apostles. And as St. Bernard says, Jesus Christ is the, is the head of the Catholic Church. Mary is the neck of the mystical body. Because through the neck, all the information goes from the head to the rest of the body. So from Christ the head, through Mary, come all the graces. And this is how God wants it, because He loves the Virgin Mary. He elevated her as to be the most precious, beautiful gem or diamond He ever created. And Mary is the chosen mother, the spotless virgin, the mother of God. And she is our mother too, because of the redemption. And so all graces come to her. And that's why the miraculous medal is so powerful a medal that you want to give out to your friends, give out to your enemies, give out to your neighbors, because through her all the graces come. And there she stands crushing the head of the devil, and she teaches us how to dialogue with communists, socialists, modernists, liberals, enemies of Jesus Christ, who are open enemies. And I'm not talking about you know, the neighbor across the street who doesn't know much, and he asks you, you know, why, why do you make the sign of the cross? Why, why do your girls wear a dress? Why this? Why that? Why do you have a crucifix? Why do you have a statue of Our Lady? You do talk to them, obviously, because there are souls that are lost, and you want to lead them to the truth by your good example, by charity, by the, the, the true love of your neighbor. And that's, that should shine in all of us, the children of God, the children of the light. But with the true dead set enemies of Christ, you do not dialogue. You do not shake hands with the devil. You do not dance with him because he will he, he's got more tricks than we have. And he will wrap a fast one on you and take and trip you up. <coughs> That's why Archbishop Lefebvre said we cannot shake hands with the modernists, we cannot dialogue with them until Rome clearly comes back to Catholic tradition. And so, the, the Virgin Mary, how did, how did she dialogue with the devil? Unlike Eve, Eve got curious, she got questioning, she saw the, the apple, she thought, oh well, hey, I could be like God. You won't die. 
the death, the devil said. He lied to them. You won't die the death. The first to lie. That's why we must never lie. We must hate lies. And the devil dialogued with Eve, and Eve foolishly dialogued with the devil, and Adam also. And who won? We know who won, and we still suffer from it. Called original sin. That's why there's sickness in the world. That's why there's wars. That's why there's disease. That's why you get old. That's why there's death. That's why mothers give birth with pain. That's why children can be a pain sometimes, because original sin is real. And all of us, even if you are a monk or a nun in the farthest cloister in the world, you will still have to battle the effects of sin. The devil, the flesh, and the world. And death. So, our virgin mother, she shows us how to dialogue with the devil. What do you do? You step on him. And you crush his head through the power of the Virgin Mary. That's how you deal with the enemies of Jesus Christ. You don't dance with them. And because the leaders, the leaders of our dear society, St. Pius X, who we pray for, and obviously the Pope as well, we are not Sidemicantes. How many people are hurling that against the resistance priests now all over the world? Oh, they're Sidemicantes. We are not sitting in Congress. We are holding the position the Archbishop held till he died, what the Society of Pius X held for 42 years. <coughs> there was never a question of sitting in Congress. It's, it's very, very simple. The president is president. He's destroying our country. We see it. We're watching it happen before our eyes. It is a punishment from God. But he's still the president. And the Pope, he is, yeah, he's liberal, he's modernist, he's destroying the faith. He told the United Nations, we, have the sh we share the same goals for humanity. He met with Buddhist Protestants already, and Muslims, and, and uh, Orthodox, and told them we must increase the, the respect and friendship between all the world religions. This is, a, this is a blasphemy against the first commandment. You children know this, you just studied your Ten Commandments. I am the Lord thy God. You shall not have any strange gods before me. And so we have to pray for this Pope. But we are not Sidemicantes. And we just hold the line. But that's an easy mud to, to hurl at the resistance. And why the resistance? Because we are resisting the leaders of the Society of Pius X who are pushing to go towards modernism and liberalism and to, to put themselves under Rome's authority. And in normal times, that's the most normal thing, to be under the Pope, to be normalized and canonically recognized. That's, that's all the most normal thing. But it's not normal times. What do you do when the Pope is destroying the Catholic faith and not preaching it? and preaching ecumenism and religious liberty and collegiality and all the false errors, and now even bringing up the question of, well, married clergy may be a possibility. And doing nothing against his bishops and priests all throughout the world who are endorsing now same-gender marriages, which is a terrible, uh, horrible sin against God. And all the vices that they are not condemning the only vice they're condemning in their eyes is Catholic tradition. And as, the, as Pope Francis recently said, we can't go backwards towards the past. We've got to go forwards to the real fulfillment of Vatican II. So, dear faithful, the, the apostles who were mice before, when they were filled with the Holy Ghost, they were lions. They left the cynical like lions, roaring the Catholic faith, roaring the Catholic truth. And on the first Pentecost Sunday, how many were converted? 4,000, and then 5,000, and many, many conversions of the Jews. And remember, just 50 days ago was Good Friday, the, the earthquake of the crucifixion, the eclipse of the sun for three hours, 
the dead rising out of the tombs, walking through the streets of Jerusalem, <coughs> telling the Jews, you killed the Messiah. And the, bl the bloody red moon that came up the night of Good Friday, that's recorded by, that's, that's, well, that's the, astron the uh, astronomers can conclude that now. There was a bloody red moon on Good Friday. And then the earthquake at the resurrection. And, and the Christ risen from the dead. No one has ever risen from the dead. And so all this was still fresh in the mind. It was all in the headline news. And the temple had been destroyed and the curtain of the temple ripped in half from top to bottom. Did you ever try taking a pair of scissors to uh, a thick uh, garment, a thick piece of material? It's not easy to cut. So imagine 60 foot high, uh, the, the, the veil in the temple, 60 feet high, a very thick material, ripped not from bottom up, but from top to bottom. It was God saying, the Jewish religion is dead, it's over, it's fulfilled. And the true religion now is our Lord Jesus Christ and his holy Roman Catholic Church. So the apostles went out to preach the Holy Roman Catholic faith. And what happened to them? They were imprisoned, they were whipped, they were kept in chains, they were uh, mocked, they were uh, later put to death. And one time St. Peter was kept in prison and the angel came and broke his chains and led him out of the prison. And uh, the Virgin Mary says, St. Maximus, <coughs> St. Maximus, an early Catholic martyr, he said that the Virgin Mary herself went to visit them in the prison to encourage the apostles, bring them food, and encourage them to, be, to die and to spread the faith of, of, of that her divine son gave. So that is the great, beautiful mystery of Pentecost. Pentecost. And today, children, the, our Lord says that the Mother Church puts these, this beautiful gospel today. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And what's his word? It's all his teaching, all his commandments, all his doctrine to love God above all, to love your neighbor for the love of God and uh, all his teaching in the scripture and tradition. If, you, if anyone loved me, he will keep my word. And that is the secret of happiness, is to follow our Lord Jesus Christ and all his teaching and, and all that's taught in the Catholic faith and the, and the commandments. That is the secret of happiness. If you want to be happy, keep his commandments. If you want to be miserable, break them. And believe me, believe me, we priests see many, many souls all over the, the, the country, all over the world, who, be, who have a, often a miserable life because of sin. They choose to offend God, and they wonder why, why their soul is all messed up. But our Lord didn't promise that you won't suffer. But he says here, uh, my Father will love it, and we will come to him and will make our abode in him. The Holy Trinity will come and live in your soul. What is this called? We know this from your catechism. Sanctifying grace. What does that mean, sanctifying grace? That means the most holy Trinity lives in your soul. And that's why the saints were so happy, even in the midst of much suffering. And all the saints, in every way, in, in all different ways, they all suffered in some way. Because in this life, we, we, we must carry our cross with our Lord. And so all of us have a perfectly measured cross that God, as St. Francis de Sales says, God has perfectly cut, measured, and weighed every single cross of every single day that we carry, it's the most perfect cross for our sanctification for that moment. 
So, he didn't promise we won't suffer. But if you keep the commandments, you're going to suffer joyfully, happily, peacefully. Because you know that you're glorifying God, uniting your suffering and your duties of state with Jesus on the cross. But the most miserable life is to live an enemy of God by breaking his commandments, living in mortal sin, loving mortal sin, and not going to confession, putting off the change of heart, <coughs> contrition and, con and conversion, putting all that off, and uh, that is to live a miserable life. Because to live in mortal sin is already to have a foot in hell. To live in the state of grace, you already possess heaven in your soul. Because God lives there. And you don't see him, you don't touch him, you don't taste him, but in your conscience you know. And that's why you children, you made your first confession. You know in your soul, you feel like you could fly. You feel as light as a feather because because your soul is made pure by God's grace, by His precious blood. So today you're going to receive the first time, and for all of us, we should make it like our first time, the very body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. And it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful reality. No false religion, no false Paganism ever dreamt of a God that would do what the true God has done. That he would come down from heaven, die for us to, to break our slavery to Satan, free us from the worst slavery, which is sin, and stay with us in all the sacraments. In confession, he, he heals your wounds, your bruises, of your soul, and if you die by mortal sin, he brings you back to life. And in the Holy Eucharist, he feeds you. And not with, you know, a super vitamin, but his own life, his own blood. And that's the proof of the great love of God, because he, he wants to give everything, and he does give everything. He can't give more. He cannot give more than what he gives to us in the Holy Eucharist. So, you children, open wide your heart, and all of us, open wide your heart to ask God to fill our soul with the great, all the graces we need to grow in the love of God, to obtain heaven, to fight sin, and to serve God joyfully. And he gives you by the Holy Eucharist all the strength you need and when the Israelites were in the desert, God fed them for 40 years. How did he feed them? He sent down manna. Every morning they would find manna all over the, the ground. 600,000 plus Jews wandering in the desert. And God fed them with this manna, which was kind of like a, it looked like a, a, a rich, dense, white Rice Krispies. And it had a, a sweet taste to it, like a honey sweet taste to it. And everybody gathered as much manna for each day that they needed. So for the man who worked harder and had to go sometimes into battle, they received extra strength from it and nourishment. And children also, they received the perfect nourishment they needed for that day. So it's really incredible because it was God feeding them with this bread from heaven every day. And the children would ask, Mom, where's all this food come from? Does it grow from the rocks and the desert ground? And she'd say, no. She says, it's from heaven. Manu means, what is this? It comes down from God to, to earth. And that only fed their bodies. But now every single mass the true Catholic Mass of all time, God does come physically down from heaven, like fire. When Elias called down fire from heaven, the priest calls down fire from heaven. And the living bread of our Lord Jesus Christ, the true God, comes on the altar and you, and you, are, you eat his flesh, you eat, you drink his precious blood, which is sweet, 
to the soul. It's, it's sweeter than honey and sweet wine to the soul. That's why in the canticles our Lord says, Come, my, my beloved, come, my friends, come to my, my uh, banquet, the sacred banquet in which Christ himself is received. The memory of his passion is renewed, reactualized in the, in the sacrifice. The soul is filled with grace, and the promise, the pledge of future glory is given to you. And so he says, come, drink, and be drunk on my wine, my sweet wine. Be inebriated, oh my friend, with this sweet wine of grace. That's what our Lord says. And this shows his, his great love for, the, for each soul. And this should be our greatest happiness, is to receive our Lord. Now when you receive him in Holy Communion, your tongue won't taste. It's going to taste just like a, a, a host. But the sweetness to the soul is rich. So open wide your hearts. And let us ask the Virgin Mother, the Virgin Mary, when you go to communion, receive, ask her heart, ask the Virgin Mother, give me the heart that you had to love our Lord. Give me your heart to love you with, O Virgin Mother. And she will. She will <coughs> increase in you with every communion. She will turn up the volume, as it were, the intensity of, of, the, of the love of God. And that's how charity grows. So, uh, and also one last message for you children is ask a special grace today. There's a special grace with your first communion. So ask great things of God. And I'll tell you what to ask that many saints have asked, which is, Lord, Help me to love you with all my heart, all my strength, all my will, and that I might attain heaven and become a saint. And the saints, there's no two saints that are alike. So God wants you, children, and all of us to be the saints, the warriors, battlers in this day. When hell is unleashed, the devil knows his time is short, he has wreaked havoc in the church, the walls of the city are down. The walls of the city have always been understood, as Cicero and Seneca did say. The walls of the city is religion. And the Catholic bishops are like the walls of the city. And all the, all the Catholic bishops today, every, almost every single one of them is a coward, spineless, destroyer, betrayer to Christ. They are weak as, as jelly. They have, they have no spine to correct the politicians, no spine to defend our Lord Jesus Christ, his kingship, his Catholic teaching. They've become useless. The walls of the city are down. The enemies, the wolves, are devouring the sheep. The shepherd is struck. The pope is confused in his head with modernism and liberalism. He is the pope, but the shepherd is struck. The sheep scattered. And now we enter, we are now in this new crisis of the church. The crisis of tradition that none of us expected, but here it is. That's what brings you here. This is why you're here at Mass in uh, this basement. Because we don't want anything to do with the conciliar church. Because we know we will lose our faith. We don't dance with the devil. And what is even more serious and more sad <coughs> And after the Mass, after the snacks and the little celebration, I'll give another brief conference um, for those who wish to stay. But very briefly now, it's the first time in the history of the Society of Pius X going against the direct, clear um, directives of Archbishop Lefebvre. This document is not some hidden, you know, hidden document in the drawer which somehow got lost. No, this is an official document sent from the official Superior General of the official SSP Act, sent officially to Rome for an official practical agreement with Rome. 
In other words, there, had Rome accepted that agreement, we would have been under Rome then, right under our nose. And the Pope, being, he, he saw that there was a division because the three bishops didn't want Bishop Fillet to do this because they saw the danger to the faith, to the faith, to the faith. And they said, don't go this way. It'll cause division, confusion, havoc, and the loss of the faith and souls. And he didn't listen. <clears throat> The Pope saw there was division among the ranks. He doesn't want to lose. So he didn't accept the agreement. They want the whole catch of fish, not half of it. Because back then, a year ago, there would have been half the priests would have stood up and said, no way. But now that it's been a year, the poison is setting in. And what happened? The official acceptance of Vatican II in the so-called light of tradition and saying that Vatican II enlightens and deepens the understanding of Catholic tradition and, 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 and also teachings that have not yet been formulated, whatever that means. And since when does the, the last bastion of Catholic tradition crumble to accept the poison of Vatican II? That is our death. And as Bishop, as some of the priests are saying now, that was, that was the death warrant for the SSPX. Plus the acceptance of the new mass as legitimate. And once you accept the new mass as legitimate, that's one step from saying it. And to say it's legitimate is like saying yeah, rat poison is, is legitimate to serve you for dinner tonight for supper. It's poison. It's going to kill you. And your parents know that. And for us to admit, us, for the leaders of the SSBX to admit that the new mass is legitimate, it's, it's, it's a revolution. It's, it's eating the poison. And then, of course, the new, canon, new code of canon law. Of course, you kids don't know what, that, what, the, what in the world that means. But it just suffices to say, if you accept Vatican II and the new mass and the new code of canon law, that means you accept to mock Christ, to ridicule him, to tear his crown off as king, and crucify him again. Because that's what the conciliar church has been doing with all its bad fruits. And not just empty seminaries, empty convents, empty monasteries, priests abandoning their vows and losing their faith, whole Catholic countries sold off in the name of religious liberty to the false religions and, and back to pagan ideas, but also the moral corruption, the immorality, the destruction of the family, the destruction of marriage, the destruction of everything sane and good is all crumbling. And whose main fault is it? It's the Catholic Church, the men of the Catholic Church who turn their back on the tradition of the church. And that's the punishment from God. And now that the, and it's very, very sad, but it's, it's what can we do? Now that the leaders of the SSPX have embraced this direction, and the proof is everybody, some of them are saying, well, what are you so worried about? There's no agreement. So the document of April 15th is dead. But if, it, but if it's really dead, then let's hear it condemned. Let's hear it re rejected. Let's hear it renounced. And none of that has happened. In fact, the opposite is happening. Any priests of the society who are promoting the, the movement to go under Rome and the liberal idea of uh, the canonical normalization and working together with the diocesan bishops, all these priests are patted on the back and promoted. But if any priest dares to say anything against this new direction, they are instantly punished, instantly transferred, instantly threatened, and that shows the new direction. And as uh, Father Pfeiffer puts it, um, you know, last April 15th, and actually July 14th, that was the chopping off of the head of the chicken of the SSPX. And the life that you see continuing is, is the reflection of the feathers. And, you know, when the chicken loses his head, he runs around 
He looks like he's alive, but he's not. But it's just the nerves twitching, and he runs around flapping his feathers, but his head's cut off. And that's, that is kind of what has happened. And it will take a miracle to put that head back on, and fish and fillet will do a U-turn. But there's no sign of it. It's very, very serious, very, very sad. And uh, that means the SSPX is in hot water. That's why the resistance. And that's why we don't want, as Archbishop Lefebvre told the priests in spiritual journeys, read it on page 13. Every priest should know this by heart. But now they're just ignoring it. And he said, if you want to keep your priesthood, and you keep your Catholic faith, you must keep very far away from the conciliar church. The closer you draw to that conciliar church, you will lose your faith. And so some of the liberals within the society are saying, oh, see, you're set of a now. And that's what was written by the superior general to the three bishops. Oh, you, you have the spirit of practical sedevicantism. No, we're not sedevicantists. But we do know that Archbishop Lefebvre, who wrestled with these beasts of the modernists in Rome, he knew that if you put yourselves under them, they will crush the Catholic faith and tradition. <coughs> How do you know? Where's the proof? There are nine traditional communities who have come under modernist Rome, and they are one by one fell to compromise, accepting the new Mass, Vatican II, and they cannot preach against it. They cannot preach against the new Mass. Ask any Society of St. Peter priest. They cannot preach against the new Mass. They will instantly be beheaded. Even, if, even though some of them privately might be against it. But as an objective order, they cannot. And that is a compromise. So, let us turn to the martyrs, let us turn to the Virgin Mother, and you children, there was one saint, there was one saint who received communion and she died on that very moment out of love for God. She died out of love for God. And many children who received communion, like St. Tarsisius, you know about him, and some of the Cristero martyrs, and some of the martyrs in Ukraine, and martyrs in France during the French Revolution, and in England, and in Ireland, who were killed for being Catholic, they received their strength from our Lord Himself. So ask, because you're going to eat fire. You're going to eat the living fire very soon, the fire of God's love. Ask Him to burn in you a great love for God, so that like St. Lawrence, the, the breviary says, the love of God burnt hotter in his heart than the fire that burned his body. And he could crack jokes. He was lying there cracking jokes, being burnt alive. And they said his body smelled like, almost like incense, because he was pure. He was pure in heart and flesh. And St. Lawrence uh, had a great love of God, that he was fed by the Holy Eucharist. He would serve Mass of Pope St. Sixtus every day. And Pope St. Sixtus was being brought to be killed for the Catholic faith, the Pope. Was this Pope talking about dialogue with the pagans? Oh, we'll burn a little incense too, just to share some ecumenical, um, ecumenical fellowship. Is that? No. He said, I cannot do that. There's only one true God, one true Jesus Christ. So St. Sixtus was being led to martyrdom, and St. Lawrence said, said, my father, where are you going? You're, and he said, I'm going to my death. He said, don't go without your deacon. Don't go without me. I served your mass. I was always with you at the sacrifice of the mass. Don't go without me. And the Pope, St. Sixtus, turned around and he said, my son Lawrence, You'll be with me in a few days. And St. Lawrence was cooked alive. And these martyrs went to death. What gave them the strength? Because we can't do that on our own. No, none of us can. It takes a supernatural grace. And you get your strength right here. From Christ's sacred heart. Who loves you and will give you his love the more you ask. In the Holy Eucharist. So let's ask the Mother of God and you children... After the Mass, we'll have the snacks, 
and for the children, we'll, uh, we'll enroll you outside in front of the statue with the brown scapular, and then we'll take a few pictures if you want. And then I'll have, uh, for those who wish to stay, the conference that won't be too long. Well, you've heard that before. But it shouldn't be too long because I have to catch a flight and leave at 11 for, uh, for Phoenix for Mass tonight. O Mary conceived without sin, 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 O